Okay, thank you. Okay, hello everybody. Welcome to our webinar, How to Invest in MedTech Startups. This webinar is a co-production of SIGTIC, uh, largest business angel investor club of Switzerland. We'll hear more about it, as well as CITEM Insel, Insel Hospital, largest hospital of Switzerland, uh, CITEM, the translational center of the Insel Spital, and the associated startup club, CITEM Startup Club. We will hear more about this as well. I'll have the honor to be your host and moderator during this session. Next slide. My, uh, my name is Heiko Visarius. Some of you know me. I'm an engineer by education, stumbled into bioengineering, spent 20 years with the big med tech companies and lived my dream since about 11 years as a coach for various institutions, uh, so-called life science expert, moderator, board member, et cetera. And I'm also a board member of the CETA Minsel Startup Club. And I know the good folks from SIGTIC since many, many years. Next slide, what's our agenda? First, we will have two presentations of five minutes each, where we have Thomas Dudendorfer, the president of SIGTIC, as well as Danny Buser, uh, the uh, president of the board of CITEM and also board member uh, and president of the CITEM Startup Club, introducing their respective organizations. And then I'm very proud to have a very cool panel comprised of a mix of corporate venture, business angel investor, uh, an experienced founder, et cetera. And we'll have a panel discussion touching on various questions that might be relevant to the investment perspective. And in the end, we have a, a Q&A. So please, all of you in this call, uh, uh, put questions in the Q&A section uh, of this. So it's called F&A if you have the German version or Q&A. Uh, in the English version of Zoom. So put questions there. Julia from SIGTIC will collect these questions. And at the end, uh, in uh, about 45 minutes time, uh, it's your uh, chance to shine by placing questions. And then we will have the panelists at hand, the four panelists to answer these questions. So uh, let's go on. Uh, we will start with the first presentation. The first presentation comes to us by uh, Thomas uh, Dübendorfer. If you compare the picture on his slide and the picture on the video, you see he has not aged at all over the last uh, 10 years that he's been with, uh, or seven years, uh, nine years that he's been with SIGTIC. Uh, Thomas has a PhD in computer science from the ETH. He has worked in the industry, uh, particularly to name, he was seven years with Google as a tech lead. Uh, he has then joined several startups and built several startups, Spontex, which was exited to Scout24, Cedar, Yes.com, uh, Contonista, which was exited to uh, Aduno, Frontify, uh, Service Hunter also exited. He has also joined the um, a team of beekeeper as a coach and as a team member. And uh, since 2014, he has been co-founder and president uh, of SIGTIC. And uh, Thomas, uh, please uh, let us know what is SIGTIC. Welcome, Thomas. Thanks, Michael. Hello, everyone. I'm very great to see that we have so many people interested in medtech. I'm really looking forward to the panel. But let's uh, look quickly at what SIGTIC is. So we are in a not-for-profit association in Switzerland, and we see ourselves as a community, a community of investors that want to invest into startups that set foot in Switzerland. And so we bring up to 2 million of venture capital from our angel investors and our institutional investors, such that great ideas become even better products. And we match make early stage startups with our smart money investors. We have grown to more than 500 investor members, which all have the willingness and the capability to actually invest. And last year, we had 106 financing rounds organized through SIGTIC, which was about 69% of basically investments in that space that we are active of all the startups that got funded in our sector of tech startups in the early stage. And with that, we definitely have a strong contribution to innovation and growing the ecosystem. Now, we always look for more startups. So on the next slide, you see a call for startups. 
We have um, more events coming up this year, uh, for example, in Lugano, December 7th, or in Zurich at the ETH AI Center on December 5th. And if you want to apply and pitch as a startup, you can do so until November 17th. Just go to our website, sigtic.ch slash pitch, or if you know a startup or a founder, yeah, please tell them. We always look uh, for cool startups that uh, want to get investors. Now, we also have a thing called Academy, which is basically a collection of know-how for mostly investors, but it might also be interesting for founders. So we have videos uh, from entrepreneurs like Bettina Hein, you might know her from Hürda Löwen, or from venture catalysts like Michael Siedler from Adalpine. Uh, they talk about how to sell a company. And we also have a handbook for investors. So we found everything on our website uh, on SIGTIC or if you search for SIGTIC Academy. Now we have many more events coming up in November. So here's the list of events. We have even more in December. So we're going to partner with Startfeld in St. Gallen to have another investor day there tomorrow. Then we also go to Liechtenstein. We do launches for angels. Uh, then we go to IMD in Lausanne to have an investor day there. And uh, we have also a partnership with the Economy of Trust Foundation in Lausanne, where we will be on 28th of November. And we have academies run in Geneva. So check out our website, uh, 60.ch events, and sign up for one of our next events. You don't need to be an investor member for most of them. So just go there and check it out. And with that, I hand over to Daniel Uzer. And we first hand over to Heiko, who will introduce uh, Daniel. <laughs> He's going to Good. share his own slide deck, right? Yeah, Daniel. So, uh, uh, Julia, maybe you can unshare these, and then Daniel can share his. Fantastic! While I, uh, while I introduce Daniel, yay! How great this works. So, uh, Danny Buza, who is joining us at the moment uh, from Dallas, uh, Texas, United States. Uh, he has been in his uh, original day job life a professor for oral surgery. Uh, in Bern, where he was also uh, educated. He has been there for 19 years uh, as a professor. Uh, and under uh, his leadership, uh, not only did he publish 400 papers, but I think uh, even more so, he positioned the dental clinic of Bern in the European uh, top 10. Uh, and I think this is absolutely remarkable. Uh, he's also the mastermind behind the successful commercial success of a small company called Straumann. Uh, I think it's fair to say that Daniel was involved in many, many uh, of the breakthrough development that this company does. And as a matter of fact, uh, he can't stop it. So I think he's in the US still uh, educating now young surgeons on the use of the new Straumann implants. Uh, absolutely remarkable. Uh, uh, then he tried to retire, uh, but uh, of course it didn't work. Uh, and so he's the president of the board of directors today for CTEM Insel. Uh, he's also the president of the CTEM Startup Club that he will just talk about in a second. And he's also um, the president of the board of directors of the Kursaal Bern and also moved all of these institutions forwards. Uh, his activities, a list of activities is much longer, but uh, it, we don't have the time to go through all of that. Uh, Daniel, thank you for taking the time from your US trip to join us here. Uh, big welcome, Danny Busa. Okay, thank you very much, Heiko. It's my big pleasure to present to you. Of course, compared to SIGTIC, we are a young player in the field. Uh, we were established three years ago. I will explain that to you, and you see the building here on the right side. Now, important to understand is that uh, we are actually part of a big campus. It's called uh, Insel Campus Bern, the only one we have in, in Switzerland where the whole medical expertise is concentrated with four big players. One is University Hospital, Inselspital, but then we have more than 10 research and teaching institutes of the University of Bern. We have this Sitem Insel, a translational center, and the youngest child is the Sitem Startup Club we established uh, uh, three years ago. Very important, the short working distances and the excellent traffic accessibility because when you go from east to west, you have eight minutes by walking. And this is a huge advantage in the field of medtech uh, startups. Uh, when you go to Insel Hospital, I don't have to explain that everybody knows this is the largest uh, university also we have in Switzerland. Brand new, they just opened up a new 
a tower uh, that was built for 670 million Swiss francs, the most modern hospital we have in the moment, probably in Europe. The other one is that we have also these uh, institutes by the University of Bern that includes dentistry, where I have been working, pathology, infectious diseases, biomedicine, art, org, forensic medicine. The next five years, anatomy will be moved to that campus. Also, biochemistry will be moved to that campus to really concentrate this. Uh, uh, in total, the state of other Canton Bern and also Inspital will invest 2 billion Swiss francs. Uh, in the within 15 years to really uh, invest into this campus. See, Sittaminsel, that's the third player. That's a uh, very successful PPP project. That's a, uh, you can say, a Schulterschluss between the university side and uh, industry. CSL bearing, you see Ipsomed, uh, Strauman joined very early on. Uh, this is a building with more than 12,000 square meters of usage, and you see it's 98% actually occupied. Uh, 32 platforms, either from University of Bern, from Insel Group, and then a lot of private companies. And there, of course, we figured out that the strength of this, actually the binding element of all these players is the medical faculty. The medical faculty is the largest now in terms of students' education. We have 2,400 students in the medical field. And of course, you can imagine what that means. You have there a huge potential of brain and talent. And therefore, this is very good for uh, innovation on that campus. Now, as I say, the last uh, uh, on the youngest child is this uh, Citamatic Hub. This is an industrial building, uh, two minutes from the campus away, uh, and we found it by chance. Uh, we hired it, and we offer their access to space, access to coaching, and access to investors. That's very important, very similar to SIGTIC, but we have this space, and you see behind is a very strong uh, board, including HICO. We have here involved also the Berner Fachhochschule, uh, the, uh, we have there also a very strong lawyer in that field, and we also have a member of the parliament with Esther Fridley. And we have a group of uh, running the show, uh, SSC team with four collaborators in the moment. The occupancy is now more than 80%. Uh, this is uh, remarkable. We started to open the hub in early December two years ago, it was a 21. And uh, uh, I have to say, you see, a very big achievement was when we also got CESM to move into the building to get all these engineers from Neuchâtel. This is the MedTech group of CESM, which is now in there with 80 collaborators. And this is in the roof. And this, of course, have given us an additional expertise. Okay, we have a so-called MedTech booster program where Heiko is very instrumental. Uh, that means uh, these uh, these uh, candidates of startups, early stage, they come, we check them out. If we see a potential, then we go into this coaching program. And then, of course, when they are ready, then we present them to uh, the club of investors uh, of the SSC. And uh, this uh, is running very nicely. I can tell you that uh, we have in the moment 14 startups now located in, in this building. We have already five alumni that came in and they moved out. Uh, and of course, it's a constant coming and going, but we are growing. And this is very interesting. I think they all appreciate they have access to these medical doctors, but they also have access to lawyers uh, with IP rights, you see, with patents and everything. And of course, regulatory is very important in the field of med tech. Okay, very important for us is a partnership ecosystem. And you see, I don't want to go through the whole list. We have everything which is needed in the med tech field, including the lawyers companies. You see the, the patent companies, they're all partners of this whole ecosystem. And uh, we have also networking partners. These are all partners active in the field of startups in general. Last but not least, access to investors. We don't have 500 members. Uh, we have. Uh, we want to have 50 members, uh, uh, and we are getting close uh, to be actually sold out. 
we have two categories. We have <clears throat> so-called leading partners. And uh, I show you here the names. Uh, Simena, this is top notch in the field of uh, health sciences and uh, med tech. They all pay 25,000 bucks uh, just every year uh, to have a very attractive offering to these startups. And we are still uh, talking to uh, three additional ones and we hope that we can fill it up to 15. And then we have so-called private and institutional members. They pay us 5,000 Swiss francs per year. I don't want to go through that list, but here you see some of the most famous medtech uh, persons we have. You see from Strom and Ipsomate, from, from Matisse, you see. And altogether, they pay more than half a million Swiss franc that can be used to make our offerings very attractive. So uh, we are constantly developing this. Condom burn is behind it, B Advance is behind it, and of course, most important, the companies, as uh, the medtech companies. That's all I can tell you. I hope I was not too long. Thank you very much. Thank you, Daniel. Uh, great overview and uh, unbelievable how much has been built there in only uh, uh, in only two years' time uh, with all the support. Absolutely amazing. Good, so we will move on. Uh, when I was jogging on Friday morning, I had the idea maybe I can put together on one slide uh, uh, the key points that I see from my practice as a medtech coach, medtech investor, uh, and uh, people who helps medtech investors. Um, what, what are the key points that we may look at? And I don't know if you want, you want to, may want to take a screenshot of that or uh, memorize it. Some of these uh, points we will come back to. And uh, before I introduce our four panelists, uh, we go into the panel discussion, just point out a few observations from my side. Uh, to me, it's very important that we have an innovation that's the top left that beats the standard of care and beats the competition, and not just by a little bit. Uh, it has to be tremendously better, by an order of magnitude better. And I'm interested to see what the panelists will say also in their intro statements about that. Uh, then I always say you have to build the bridge from innovation to reality, because your innovation has to land in the reality of hospitals and clinical practices as we have it today, because they will not change for you. And the question is, do you fit into the workflows as we have them in the hospitals? Do you also, and that's the next point, fit into the reimbursement systems? Or do you dream about patients paying out of pocket for your wonderful innovation, which by the way, is probably not gonna happen. The next, is it protected? Uh, can you make sure that you have a magic sauce that you have patents, uh, maybe even a trade secret or whatever to protect it. The next thing that we will look at from the investment side is of course the experience of the team, the motivation of the team. And is this team really having complementary skills? Is it set up to drive this medtech uh, story, which will go two, three, four, five, six, seven years until it becomes profitable, do we have the right people and do we have the right people around the startup team? So the board, advisors, the investors, who are these investors? Are these people who bring value or are these just people who have money? I mean, nothing wrong with having money and investing it, but what's even better is to have the money and bring the expertise. Then of course, the business model, every investor all the time wakes up when there's a finance slide and every investor all the time asks, well, how are you gonna earn money? So how are you gonna show that? And lastly, as we are in, uh, in MedTech, the regulatory strategy, is it a CE access? Is it class 2A, 2B? Do you have a notified body? Uh, uh, did you have a pre-sub meeting with FDA, blah, blah, blah. All these topics are coming up and uh, I'm very happy <coughs> that I'm now able to introduce a nice mix of panel members that uh, we can discuss this with. The way we're gonna do that is I will introduce very, very briefly each one of the four panel members and then ask the panel member to give a short statement, couple of minutes maximum uh, on, on how they are related to startup medtech investment. 
uh, and, and to this whole topic. I can tell you we have a superb mix of corporate VC, business angel investor, business angel club representatives, as well as, uh, as an experienced entrepreneur. And we're going to start with uh, Patrick Gries, who joins us from Zurich Eventual Corporate VC. Patrick has a PhD in microsystem technology uh, 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 from Stockholm, actually. Uh, also has a Master of Science from EPFL. Patrick has been with uh, Roche Diagnostics for a while until he joined um, uh, Zürke first as a business manager and team lead in engineering for four years. So he's done really that side as well. But uh, since uh, 2011, so also now since quite a while, uh, he's been building and running Zürke Venture. He's known in the whole medtech investor scene, particularly for that. He's Mr. Zürke Venture. And he has been board member or advisor and supporter of numerous medtech startups that became very famous, such as Distal Motion, Luna4, Lumendo, Evismo, Precom, Botneuro, to name a few. The list is even longer. Uh, Patrick, it's great to have you. Thank you, Heiko. And it's always great to work with you. So it's a great pleasure to be here tonight and share my experience to some extent. As you said, I've been my PhD in Stockholm was actually health tech already. So since 25 years, I'm in health tech. As you said, at the time, it was for General Electric, then for Roche, then for Zülke, where I had the, the responsibility for customer projects. And since 12 years with Zülke Ventures, uh, we've invested in the US, in Sweden, in Switzerland. Uh, we've seen all these ecosystem ecosystems. And um, you pointed out uh, the, the the right uh, topics to discuss tonight. I think it's going to be very interesting to, to, to dive into these very specific problems that we have or challenges that we have in this great opportunity of health technologies. Thank you very much, Patrick. It's great to have you on the panel today. We'll move over to Guido, Guido Cargis. He has degrees in, in law as well as in economics. Uh, to most of you in the medtech world, he's known as the guy who ran Straub Medical for a total of uh, 14 years and also put in place and executed on the exit of Straub Medical to BD in 2021. Uh, then he also tried to uh, uh, do a sabbatical and uh, early retire and it didn't work, I understand. So he came back uh, to the turf. Uh, as an investor and we're very happy about that because he's now bringing all his expertise of uh, uh, of all these years that he was in the operational business as an investor into the board. Guido, it's great to have you. Thank you very much, Heiko, and welcome everybody. Um, I want to share my experiences too. Um, as Heiko correctly said, I um, did some legal studies and also some, um, uh, uh, what do you call it, business administration studies. But um, I want to start a little bit earlier. I was born the first son of a physician and a drug developing biochemist. So um, I had completed half a medical degree by the time of my A-levels, just by overhearing the, my parents' conversations over dinner when they were discussing patients and how they could be diagnosed and treated and so on. Nevertheless, as you've heard, I embarked on a career with basic legal training and subsequent professionalization in consulting activities in the field of marketing and sales. I did justice to my medical roots by training as a paramedic. Um, I... During that time, um, it, uh, when I was um, doing the paramedic uh, training uh, parallel to my to my business activities, I completed several internships in intensive care and uh, operating theaters and uh, the like. Uh, I then completed also a degree in business administration with a focus on entrepreneurship and marketing. Nevertheless, I believe I'm the least academic person here on this panel. Uh, no PhDs, no professorships, nothing, uh, just basic training. I started my career then uh, 30 years ago uh, as a research associate in a larger European market research and marketing consulting company in Frankfurt. 
Uh, there we did consulting to automotive companies, but also medical technology companies, pharma companies. Um, I then founded my own marketing consulting company, and we did also consulting to pharma, medtech, and other industries. Um, but then um, all of the sudden, I got a very, very, very interesting offer by a large uh, European conglomerate uh, to join them. And so I sold my shares in, in that uh, um, consulting company uh, to my existing partners. And um, in this uh, large retailer of uh, craft supplies, um, tools and the like, I acquired also some technical knowledge, which was very useful later on in my career. Uh, I held various positions in this uh, company, and uh, but at, at some point exited it, uh, left it uh, to go back into consulting, um, uh, where I got in touch with the medical um, industries again. And so again, I switched the sides and joined uh, the medical industry on the operative side. I held roles in Centec, for example, in Basel Land, um, uh, where I was in charge of marketing and sales, first for Asia Pacific and later on globally. And as Heiko mentioned, uh, I have been the CEO of Straub Medical for almost 15 years, where together with my team, we were able to develop the company from a loss-making startup uh, in development phase, more or less, uh, to a working production company uh, and to a very profitable um, global leader in, in the niche that we're working in. And uh, that became so attractive that in 2020, uh, we were able to sell this company to Beckton Dickinson uh, BD which is, I think, one of the largest international medical technology companies. And um, I believe that attracting the attention of such a heavyweight and uh, successfully negotiating with such a Goliath, uh, with its um, army of lawyers and um, uh, the experts and uh, the people who are scrutinizing you, um, uh, and successfully then uh, getting a, a very, very attractive deal. I think that is the biggest achievement of uh, my team and myself, and we're very proud of that. Uh, at the same time, we negotiated with several of these large companies, so we could have fallen back on other bidders of a similar caliber, but uh, BD uh, won the bidding, and, and that's uh, how we then ended up with them. The inevitable consequence of this acquisition was me leaving the company one year later, and uh, since then, I use the time for, as Heiko said, I, I deliberately took a sabbatical and uh, then thought that, um, yeah, with my various leisure time activities, which include hiking, skiing, motorbiking, reading, traveling, and even precision shooting, uh, I could fill my day, but that, that's not the case. So um, I, I want to burn for something. I need an inner flame. Uh, and 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 uh, a, a a challenge, and so I'm now an investor. Um, I hold board memberships. I do consult to medtech startups and larger companies uh, happily, and uh, yeah, I'm always open for new suggestions on what we could do together. So thanks very much. Uh, 119 people in the audience that uh, have great ideas. On. <laughs> so careful. <laughs> great. Thanks very much. Thank you. Thank you, Guido. That's fantastic. Uh, next in line is Rüdiger, uh, another fellow German. And uh, Rüdiger comes to us with a master's in business administration and electrical engineering, Wirtschaftsingenieurwesen, as the Germans say. Uh, he was. He comes uh, strongly also from the finance side. He was nine years with Swisscom, uh, eventually as a CFO. He was on six years as a CFO of Publicitas, uh, is a, certainly an M&A expert and has joined SIGTIC. He is also the regional head of SIGTIC Burn. That's why he's also one of my go-to guys for all of our activities together. And he's also vice president of ZED Capital. He will probably explain what that is. It's great to have you, Rüdiger. Thanks. Thank you very much, Heiko. 
Um, so I, I keep it slightly shorter. Um, so yes, I joined Sictic uh, in 2016 uh, with a focus to build up the FinTech chapter. This is exactly from the beginning onwards, I had no idea about MedTech. So my, my background is telecommunication, digital business, ICT. That, that is my background. Nevertheless, since two years with the um, investment arm of the CEDID, the Centrum of Innovation and Digitalization in Bern, uh, I'm managing a portfolio of 18 uh, startup companies, young entrepreneurial companies, and uh, nearly one third of them um, are ex exactly engaged in the med tech industry. So I had to move then into the med tech industry and and to see them exactly what happens, how they're developing, and, and we are slightly as well jointly engaged in them. And that was exactly why we have met each other as well. And in addition, I have been as well a CEO of a medtech device company. Um, so this is my background. And uh, I have exactly, I had to learn the medtech difference to the ICT world. And this is what I bring to the table. Perfect. Thank you. The perfect bridge builder for us. And the last, certainly not least, uh, we have uh, somebody who has made the journey uh, of building a uh, startup from, I would say, almost scratch. It's uh, Stefan Tuchschmidt. He has a PhD uh, ETH in medical simulation uh, uh, obtained in 2010. And out of this work, uh, I know Stefan for many, many, many years. And I know that out of this work, it was also based also on other PhD theses. The company Virtamed was formed where Stefan spent the last 16 years and he grew it from, I believe, at the beginning, a headcount of two to now a headcount of over 120. It's uh, one of the Swiss success stories in startup world. In uh, This year, I still remember when he talked to me in June at Swiss MedTech Day and informed me that, Heiko, I'm stepping back as co-CEO and founder and uh, 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 will join the board of directors as president and focus on that. And uh, he's now already sorting out all the other activities that he's doing. Stefan, it's great to have you. Thank you, Heiko. Um, yeah, you said a lot already. Um, I, I think today I hope I can uh, contribute as a case study for you for a successful business angel investment. So when we started Vertimate in, in 2008, uh, venture capital, uh, was not really an option for our company because there was another Swiss company uh, that burned through like 15 million of venture capital in a very short time without showing any results. Um, and also, as I had at that stage, zero experience in building up a company, I, I really liked the idea of having experienced people there as mentors. Uh, so we got, you know, six business angels and, 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 and the bank for a total of 1.2 million. And then the nice thing was, this was actually enough for us to get this to, to cash profitability. And we were able, after nine years, it did take some time, but after nine years, all the business angels were able to exit uh, the company with an eight time cash multiple. And, and also the founders were able to sell a small stake. So, so I guess everyone was pretty happy. Um, and then kind of the, the story continued. So it was a startup first, really like in an ETH garage with two people and then a scale up story. Uh, and since then it moved to a typical, I would say stable Swiss SME where the majority now is owned by a, a private equity firm called Armira. Right. So currently, as, as Heiko said, I'm, I'm on the board of director. That's also not a full-time job and I need something that keeps my passion burning. So as we heard before, so I'm actually now back to the roots. I'm at the ETH Center for Artificial Intelligence and I mentor student entrepreneurs here, startup and scale up companies. Uh, I also support the center for anything within surgery, med tech, health tech related um, things. I really like the combination between artificial intelligence and it's for reimbursement and regulatory affairs. It's not straightforward to do with artificial intelligence. So that's what I'm really, really interested uh, to, to find out. Excellent. And Thank looking you so forward much. to the panel. I'm looking forward now to your questions to us. Yes. So uh, I prepared a number of panels, uh, questions for the panel. Some of them the panel uh, already knows and some are surprises. But uh, let's dive into it. And my first question, Patrick, uh, goes to you and then to Guido. So what are the three, four things that you're looking at? I mean, you get a lot of PDFs every day, I presume. 
Uh, I know that the VC sometimes get a few thousand and then they make seven investments. What is it? What can we do right as startups to strike your interest? So it, if I if I start, um, num number one is and that everybody says that it's it's the team. I need mean, we'd like to see a a, a great team, and uh, we are we refrain from investing in single single founders. We always would like to see a team. Um, number two, it it should be a business. Uh, an invention is not enough. I mean, a great invention is is great for research. But as you said before, Heiko, it should have some impact in clinical practice. And and so is it the business is the answer to uh, does it have impact in clinical practice and uh, is it reimbursed? So reimbursement is an important one. And then the last one closely connected to, to, uh, to the practice is a regulatory pathway. For us as a small investor, it's very important that we that we choose the the fast deals. So we're looking for quick uh, uh, um, regulatory pathway. If you are more powerful, if you have more dry power, you go you can go for the long run. But we look for a short uh, in, in value inflection points because we're a small investor. Very good, great, uh, good insights, Guido. Uh, you are. You're going the full risk, the skin in the game, invest your own money, uh, your hard-earned money. So uh, what is it that that you think, oh yeah, that's that's those are the ones. And do you get do you get asked a lot or or are you do you have to actively search cases? I don't have to search cases. I get uh, lots of suggestions uh, every day. And um I think. Uh, I absolutely agree with Patrick. Uh, the most important things are the same things and in any investment where, that you have uh, a technology that is uh, standing out, that you have uh, a good idea of the market, uh, that you have a great team together. And uh, I fully agree. I wouldn't invest into a single person ever. Uh, you need to have uh, a good team together. Um, and then it's, uh, as Patrick already mentioned, uh, uh, for me, very important uh, to understand the regulatory pathways, what classification, um, what, what class would it uh, belong to, the device um, or the, the, the diagnostic or whatever, and, uh, and uh, in, in, in which target markets um, would be would be obstacles that are not so easy to overcome, and uh, in in which target markets would it be easier, uh, and and then and then again also the reimbursement side, which is a a jungle, um, and we, you really need to understand very well um, where where you can get this device uh, reimbursed quickly, where, where it will take years or even decades, as in money in some cases to get reimbursement because without reimbursement you will never have access to the market um, you will get some private patients but not not uh, the uh, the full market so that these are the things it's the same things actually and um and these are the things that i scrutinize um i i really have to be convinced of the technology itself um i have to have a good feeling for how to overcome these three obstacles that are that are um particular for the for the medtech a market which is the, the 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 regulatory hurdle to even get uh, the allow um, the allowance to to market it to to put it on the market even if you're sometimes I, I I see founders that don't understand that even in Switzerland when they're in Switzerland they have a good product and they cannot put it on the market uh, if they don't have the approval the regulatory approval you cannot sell it so um, that's the first thing you need to get this approval. You need to get reimbursement. Then you need to convince the uh, end user, which is usually a physician, uh, and uh, and 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 um, to to have a good idea and a good story um, of how these three obstacles will be tackled. I think that is the thing that that then um, gives me a, a compelling um, idea and and um, yeah. the the motivation to look into it further. Good. Thank you so much for sharing that, Guido. Rüdiger, um, now, of course, uh, the, many of the startups that are also listening to us and also some of the investors, they, they put already an, an emphasis on these topics. Uh, and um, 
nevertheless, sometimes the startups fail. You've, uh, I, I know you've witnessed some of the failures uh, and uh, uh, seen some others uh, in, the, in the in the environment. So tell me, um, what what why why what what goes wrong here, typically? If and you... then I'm going to ask Stefan on what has already gone wrong in Virtamet on the long route. So Stefan, you can already start thinking. <laughs> Um, so may maybe uh, I will take 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 the ball just from um, Guido and Patrick just before, mm -hmm. uh, because what they just said, what is important exactly for a medtech investment, and and I think we, we are discussing as well what uh, what maybe as well ICT sick tech investors sh should have learned is uh, here you. Out of the two answers, you already got a quite clear answer. Maybe because the simple customer-centric view, because a nice product which fulfills the customer needs, this is exactly the simple ICT software as a service approach. It's fully sufficient. Here in the medtech environment, we learn if, if you don't have the approval, the regulatory approval, you can't sell nothing. If you don't have exactly a pass for a reimbursement, you don't get nothing. Uh, and exactly the person who is using it, the patient, is not the person who is really deciding it for it. So uh, your question was, what is a failure? Is exactly thinking that ICT investment it's the same as medtech investment. It's not. So, and already with, with, with three or topics, you already see what is the key difference out of it. And then exactly you have a different type of timing from mm -hmm. the technical perspective at the end, it's everything the same. But if you don't have the three other sections before clarified, uh, you as a, I think Guido said it just before he, he, he got then a startup who is coming with no clue how the regulatory part is working, how they can get the approval of that to sell it. Uh, it does not make any sense. So, and uh, why they fail, they have not made the homework. <laughs> Good. Thank you so much uh, for sharing. Stefan, as promised yeah. uh, to you, I mean, you've lived uh, through 16 years of Vietamate. Uh, I'm sure everything went totally smooth. Uh, you had no sleepless night. Uh, investors yeah. uh, came to Schlieren uh, asking where they should put the money. Um, or was it different? <laughs> so I think it's a nice case study to really show that in, in MedTech, you know, it's, you need to show a benefit for, for the patient, the benefit for the provider and the benefit for the payers. And those are different people. It's just saying that in, in other words, as people have said before, but I can make an example here. So they tell you, you know, you have to involve the customer early, right? You know, sh you know, ship before it's ready and get the feedback. And we did all that, right? And we showed our simulators very early stage to the surgeons and they all loved it. And we were so happy. We said, we have a great product and the surgeons loved it. So we were like, okay, we're in track. Um, but then we failed to really sell our simulators because there was no budget for simulation training in any of the hospitals uh, uh, line, right? They, they just didn't know what to put it. Uh, you know, usually it's like, okay, you, you, you train on cadavers or on, on human specimen or rubber models. They all cost not the 100K that we were charging for our simu uh, simulators. So we, we, we had that challenge and then we were that was actually our first pivot that we had to do. We had to say, okay, we have to fix this payer situation. And the one thing we could do it is we were teaming up with MedTech device company because we had a joint interest, right? The MedTech device companies wanted to train the physicians for the devices. They had high cost for disposables. They had a real value. Um, but it was, it was uh, fortunately, we did that very early on. Um, and that was good. Um, more recently, we see that there is, because there is still no reimbursement for simulation, it puts a really restriction a bit on the total market that Vertimate can have. Um, in principle, we would be a market the same size as aviation simulation where all the pilots are required to go and, and take their certification there. 
but because medicine is different and it's also uh, i have to say also you know honest way it's also more difficult to uh, to kind of get the whole reach from all the different disciplines all the different procedures and and, and everything covered um, but it does put a, a limit on it right um, but that being said i think it's just about the awareness and about picking the right cases for angel investments yeah. uh, that can really be explosive and can really be nice. Because at the same time, once you have a foot in the door, once you are close to the clinics, it's also not that easy to copy uh, as it is, for example, for some of the uh, IT uh, or, or software as a service uh, things, right? There's also some, some protection if you succeed in making progress on those, on those topics. Yeah. Great, thank you for, for sharing, uh, Stefan. Next question goes to uh, our investors uh, on the panel. So Rüdiger, uh, Patrick, Guido. So we talk, we hear about smart money all the time. If you find the right investor, he will not only bring the money. Is it really possible? I mean, uh, do you have specific cases where you believe that you or your organization has given more than money uh, to a startup and has that has that made a difference and how do you think you can make a difference or maybe have even examples how you made a big difference well I start then <laughs> please <laughs> you've been doing I, I, it for a while <laughs> yeah. I think I think uh, an informed uh, experienced investor can make a difference uh, I see it all the time. I see it with other investors as well. Um, it's kind of obvious if they take board seats that really um, um, help to advance the company and where it's also accepted by the syndicate and by the founders that this is really experience that's coming in because there's other board seats that are more about control, about controlling the situation. I think you can clearly see that difference. And um and in my personal experience, um, in, in most of my companies, specifically also uh, when we f freshly invested, so like the first two to five years or something like that, we have regular touch points with our startups at least uh, twice a month. And um, this doesn't have to be in the form of a board seat. This can be just uh, in, in the form of an advisory that mm -hmm. we do. And I, I I, I do think with time, the more gray hair I have, the more you see where you should say something and where you should not say something. Mm -hmm. And I think that's just a question of experience. Great. Thank you, Patrick. Guido, Rüdiger? For, 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 for my side, from the SETI day, for first of all, the, the, people, the people behind the SETI day and, and as well the network. So um, this, is, this is valuable. And this is exactly where we can bring additional access. And um, we, we, we don't have the right access to the regulatory body, bodies. Uh, there are other parties much more uh, efficient and much better. So that is exactly why we are reaching out to other partners like you, <laughs> I go. Uh, but on the other, the, the, uh, the business side network, this is exactly what we are providing. The experience, uh, I think, uh, with the ZDD, we are quite experienced in investors. So that this type of professionality and bringing in this, because this helps then later on as well for the venture rounds. And uh, we, based on the bigger portfolio, which we have uh, as well in the medtech, as well in other industries, uh, here we pro have this type of experience from other companies, how they are moving. And this is exactly what we are, can bring in immediately in the discussion with the other startups. And then we can connect them as well. And then sometimes as well in the regulatory business area as well. And, and I, I think this is the value add which we bring in. Yeah. I mean, if, if I may add to the point before I ask Ido's perspective, uh, I mean, I, I believe what Danny mentioned, uh, the network, I mean, MedTech, MedTech requires, as the name suggests, a med person and a tech person. And it also requires access to the MedTech players. I see hardly any MedTech company being successful without links to great clinicians who bring the clinical perspective of the whole thing. 
not only key opinion leaders, but also representatives of the early majority, as we say in the adoption curve, and uh, uh, also uh, having uh, uh, this whole environment of clinical people, engineering people, and strategic player available. That's where people like, I would say, all of us here in the, on, on the screen can open doors and, and help. I see also that startups are sometimes dreaming in their business plan of setting up a global sales force, but you know what? Is never going to happen, right? So this uh, the scale up and the uh, international distribution are also typically uh, uh, topics where big startups, uh, where, where big uh, strategic players are very strong at, and uh, it's to a certain extent all about finding this right moment in time to make this move from startup and selling here and selling there and 3D printing your products to, hey, we need to have an industrialized international uh, sales strategy. Guido, what, what's your take? Well, I fully agree with everything that has been said so far. Um, the question was how we get involved uh, with those uh, startups and whether we bring smart money in instead of just money. Um, I believe that I have some experience that uh, is of value to uh, uh, the startups that I invest in uh, or that I consult to. And um, so um, I'm always open to answer any questions. And I get a lot of operative questions too. Um, I've made so many mistakes in my career. And uh, so I can happily share um, what has not worked or um, what was the mitigation of, of the of the situation that resulted. And that helps uh, a lot of these younger um, leaders um, to avoid making the same mistakes, certainly. Yeah. And, and that's uh, that's how I um, see it. Um, I just, um, I'm happy to share the experience. Thank you. Um, I, wonder, I wanted to say one additional thing on the question we had before, um, the failure of startups. Mm -hmm. And I think, especially in medtech, um, one of the main reasons for failure is the underestimation of the time and money it takes to get this product on the market and to get profitable. It's much longer than in other industries because of these regulatory and reimbursement obstacles and uh, the, this time, time to market and the time for market uptake um, uh, until you have convinced this rather conservative uh, medical uh, community uh, of using your product instead of what they had done before uh, is, is something that goes underestimated in almost any company that I see. Yep. And um, I think that is something that is very important where I can also be of help uh, uh, and where I see a little bit of my expertise is uh, to to estimate um, the, the these timelines and and to and to explain that also to the investors. Yeah. So they don't get so they don't get um, yeah in a hurry or or, or nervous about it and uh, give them a realistic view on on how long they will need to keep the money in before yeah. an exit is is possible at all. So absolutely right. So regulatory is the major driver of your money line and your timeline in medtech. So something really to look into. When I look from the corner of the eye, one to the clock, but also we, we're going to go a little longer, by the way. Um, but I also look at some of the questions that have already arrived. I would say at least half of the questions. And thank you also for the positive feedback you put in the chat so far already. So the audience likes you guys in the panel. Uh, we'll keep doing what we're doing. But uh, there are a lot of questions about uh, rather fundamentals of, of regulatory. And uh, I'm certainly not the expert on regulatory, but I feel I'm always semi-educated in everything. So I'll try to give you the 20-second the view uh, from my side on regulatory. Now, in order to sell a medical device, you need this a stamp on it. Uh, either in Europe, it's a CE stamp, or in the US, it's the FDA stamp. How to get it? There's a big book to read. It's called the MDR, Medical Device Regulatory, where all of this is explained. I give you the 20 second uh, summary of uh, MDR. Basically, it tells you that you have to have a, uh, a quality system in place that is following an ISO norm. It's the ISO 13485. It basically tells you that you know where your documents are, which keys open which doors, and all these details. It's a self-learning quality management system. And then it very much depends on the 
classification on your device. So medical device regulation knows four categories, one, two A, two B, and three in order of risk. So one is a, a walking cane, a Band-Aid, simple things, two A, more complex things, two B, things that are invasive to the body, three is things that are invasive to the body, stay in the body for the long time or affect the central venous system or the cardiovascular system. I simplify quite a bit. I hope there's not too many regulatory consultants, but basically that's how it goes. Starting from class 2A, you need an external person to look at your stuff and tell you that you're doing the right thing. This external person is called a notified body, such as TÜV, DECRA, BSI, and so on and so forth. There's uh, quite a number, 20 or 25 around in Europe. However, most of them are overloaded because mostly because of the switch from the old MDD to the new MDR. So if you need a notified body, start searching it now. Uh, I mean, investors are smart enough to ask you this question. They, hey, wait a minute, your class 2B, do, did you already have a meeting with your notified body? Uh, at the moment, it's very easy to have to wait six, seven, eight months, even for a first meeting, so you can explain what you need. The other thing that you want to look into is consultants. The chance of you guys out there, the startups and also the investors of becoming regular experts is, is slim uh, and it, it requires really a lot of studying. So best is to team up and we have quite a number of these in Switzerland uh, uh, with a uh, 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 consultant who knows this. Last word briefly on FDA. In the old days, so some years back, it was uh, hard to get the FDA approval and comparably easier to get the CE approval. Uh, some people may agree that this has now switched a little bit for the reasons I just explained. Uh, the CE got sometimes a lot harder to get, taking a lot more time. And time, we're talking anywhere between guys on the panel, you can help about anywhere between two to three years to five years uh, to have the clinical trial in place, to have the submission, have the submission reviewed, finally get the damn CE so you can start selling. Uh, in FDA, in the meantime, this has, uh, uh, thanks to a special clause in the US law, it's, a, it's a Article 510, sub chapter K, hence the name FDA 510K approval, means that you say to the US, hey, look, guys, I have a device that's very similar to another device. And can you please get me a simplified uh, market access? Uh, so uh, basically, uh, uh, the FDA, since uh, one or two years, also offers, surprisingly, a meeting that you can talk to them, explain what you plan to do in terms of clinical data, how you want to submit. The FDA will say if they like it or not, or what they think is missing. And then you come back 6, 12, 18 months later with what you promised. And uh, what I'm hearing right now from startups is the FDA actually remembers what they said in the pre-sub meeting and stick to it. And that makes the whole FDA process a lot easier. So I hope that already addressed some of the questions uh, we had. My next question, and then we already- Hi, hi Heiko. Just, yeah. I just want to point out Please. two aspects to your first comments. Yeah. Uh, the notified body and the consultants. So that means what, what is everything fine and, and well summarized, thank you. Uh, but this makes exactly an investment maybe highly critical because uh, if who the notified bodies are highly busy, who gets the notified body engaged as in the first instance, these are the big companies because they have a better network. So you as a startup maybe needs to wait longer or needs to have the network or you will never get, or not never, but much later get the access to it. So this is a risk exactly for the business angel investor or for the investor in general. And then... And then you have the last point. Then you have the consultants, yes, which you probably need in order to be efficient and to be quick through this process. But that means the investor's money is paid to someone who, in general, makes no 
no no additional revenue. Stefan, you wanted to also comment on this? Uh, of course, I would. I would like to really reframe that as an opportunity because it is it is possible, right? And you see also some startups getting the approvals very very quickly because they really understand the system. It doesn't need to be ne necessarily the expensive uh, part. I think the opportunity is really to pivot early, to not take the regulatory path as this is exactly my product. Now I just have to get it approved, mm -hmm. but to listen into this meeting, how do I need to reshape this, this product? And I think on the investor side, it's also important to understand, you know, we are so used as investors, you're probably used to say you need to be different than the market, right? You want to have your, your differentiation, but to really understand, hey, if there's a predicate device, if there's a device very close, that greatly reduces the risk where I don't have to do um, you know, a large PMA study. It's a fantastic opportunity. Um, and I think it's more of, of this awareness. And this is maybe something where uh, we have, I mean, we have uh, SIGTEC also here or where, where we can give some guidance from those business angel clubs on what makes it difficult or what makes it, what makes it easy in terms of, right. of, of investments. Because right. it would be a shame to now say, oh, you know, anything class two, we should invest as business angels because yeah. it really depends. It, there's such a big range. Yeah. I mean, what we also sometimes see is that startups pivot, as you say, or reshape their product. So it's first a simple class one product, and then later they add more medical claims and it becomes a 2A or 2B product. That's also a possible route. So you can already work on your proof of concept, proof of market, with a class one device to see does it make sense uh, uh, later on uh, with this. And uh, I'm, I'm just, again, looking at some of the questions, we'll answer this along the side. So uh, uh, can you do something to shorten that time? Now, the short answer is no, except uh, uh, the strategy we just discussed, the longer answer we don't have time for, but, uh, but you can contact any of us directly. But uh, basically, I think for the investor, the, the, the learning here for the medtech investor is take a good line, look at the finance statement of the company and see how they budgeted for their regulatory pathway. If they have budgeted 200,000 francs over the next three years, and it's a class 2A product, this is not going to compute. I mean, no way. Good. Uh, maybe next question to Stefan. Uh, you have seen everything money-wise. Uh, you've, I think, got your hands into any public, private, and whatever money pot this country has to offer. Tell us a little bit about your experience. I mean, you've done the Eno Swiss, ETH, Business Angels, Family Office. I mean, uh, does this all have has their place? Does it all have to come at a certain time? How do you see things? Um, I, yeah, I think it, it it really depends on the case, but uh, I, I think it's fairly standardized now what companies are are doing. Um, I think on the investment side, I would only say. Uh, don't focus just on the very public startups that do all, you know, all the uh, Wettbewerb or all the, you know, the different, uh, the, there are also really, really good companies that decide not to invest that much into, into the, the public uh, activities. Um, but, but otherwise, I believe, I mean, doing the InnoSwiss or doing the, the grant money, uh, that's, that's kind of a must to do if you, if you have, uh, you know, if you have good projects. Um, yeah. And, and then, I think it's 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 more it's critical to then secure enough money that the team can really work on this full time and not being employed by the university and kind of do the startup twenty percent or thirty percent uh, with a number of people. So it's really you know get enough so you can take take the jump and and, and go into it. Right. Great. Thank um, you. I think if I if I just please, can please. add to that, Heiko. So Stefan, I fully agree. Uh, collect all the money that is non-dilutive that you can get your hands on, like InnoSwiss, for example, other uh, other uh, research uh, grants or foundations. And then in Switzerland, you know, we can go so far with the Swiss ecosystem, Swiss investors. The, the phase that I call earning the right to scale until you know you have product market fit, until you know you can produce, until you know your logistic service support works. I think that low level, low scale uh, commercialization, I think we can finance if you want to go international. And I think we have to go in for international uh, to be successful. Nowadays, you need international investors. Otherwise, you don't find enough money in Switzerland. Yeah, absolutely right. 
And um, just to the remark of InnoSwiss, I don't know if everybody knows this here, but uh, InnoSwiss has uh, since recently a couple of very attractive programs. One is a Swiss accelerator and one is a startup innovation program where InnoSwiss can invest directly into the startup for the first time. And the accelerator being kind of the replacement of the European EIC accelerator. And both of these have, uh, and I'm seeing this with startups I'm coaching, uh, uh, volumes of 2 million francs, for example. And that's for the most part non dilutive uh, money. So you don't have to give shares. Uh, extremely attractive. So the message again here to the angel investor in MedTech try to understand this. MedTech investment ecosystem with the various players we have. We also have, of course, several awards, even though most of them have low volumes. And I sometimes ask myself if a startup needs to jump after every 1,000 or 5,000 francs, they can win somewhere. But uh, we also have cantonal programs and, uh, as I said, particularly uh, uh, InnoSwiss. I am taking another question from the audience here. And that is the question on the B besides the MDR and all these regulatory nice things we talked about. Uh, what about things like uh, other things like cybersecurity certification, ISO 27001, uh, and I add to that as well a GDPR. Uh, who in the panel wants to take a, a shot on that? Maybe we even include Thomas, the old uh, cybersecurity expert, uh, and. Uh, uh, is this equally important as the MDR? How do you see things, guys? Well, if I may answer first, um, I believe that these things need to be observed as well. Uh, mm -hmm. This is just a legal framework that you that you live in, and uh, if you um, handle data of uh, of EU citizens, or now even in Switzerland, we have this uh, data security privacy. Um, law, then you just need to follow these laws. It's like uh, not breaking the speed limit. Um, in in Metec, uh, these these apply just the same. Um, in Metec, you will find that if you go into sales at a certain stage, there there are even more laws, uh, depending on uh, which country you sell to. There are laws that allow you to market your device or not uh, directly to the public. Um, there there are laws that allow you to. Um, uh, invite a physician for dinner or not, things like that. So there, there are lots of laws and and also um, codes of conducts, uh, business standards that you have to uh, that you have to follow. And and uh, the ISO two seven zero zero one, which is a data security thing. Um, I think there's no there's no there's no law as in any ISO standard. There's no law that requires you to have that. I believe even the MDR, uh, a little bit contradicting Heiko here on what he said before, I think even the MDR does not require you to have the ISO 313485. Uh, uh, it, it, it requires you to have a quality system that works. And uh, the ISO system, uh, ISO standard 13485, is one that is known to work or designed for the medical devices uh, companies. But uh, you just have to comply with the law. And, and so any, any of these standards just help you uh, to set up systems that, uh, that will, that will uh, then be compliant. Uh, in the end, and that's why these these standards all apply. But in the end, it's the law that you have to comply with. Maybe just adding to that, I mean, yes. ISO 27001 regarding information security, often when you work with corporate partners, it's a prerequisite before they even sign an agreement to work with you. Because if you make something bad with sensitive data, it also backslashes on your customer, right? And if they give you data, especially, they don't want you to have at least the same standards they have. It's often it's basically you have to do it because your customer requires that if it's a corporate customer. Yeah. Great. Uh, Julia, can you go but, but, back Thomas, one slide means... in the slide deck? Thank you. Okay, so uh, to to come to a close before I give uh, Thomas uh, uh, and Rüdiger of SIGTIC uh, the, the word for the presidential farewell and maybe Danny um, uh, to maybe uh, summarize the impression of the discussion uh, in a very short term. Uh, looking back uh, to, to the topics, uh, once again, uh, here on the slide, I tried to put together, I want to thank the panelists. I want to thank uh, Thomas and Danny for the intros. I hope that gave you a bit of an overview on the fantastic ecosystems we have in Switzerland. I mean, a lot is already in place. 
there's a lot of uh, support for startups, for investors, lots of explanations. And people like uh, uh, Rudiger, Thomas, Danny, me, we're all very approachable. Uh, come with questions if you want to invest, if you're doubting if you should invest, if you say, hey, I think I want to invest, but I don't want to dare do it myself. You see, we have very experienced people here uh, and we're all willing to help because we know that these startups do need the investments to make it on their way to commercial success at the end of the day. I want to once again thank all the panelists. Uh, I want to thank Sigtik and CTEM Startup to make this event possible in this way. I apologize, we're a little bit over time, but from the comments I'm seeing, I think this was uh, well worth uh, uh, the discussion. Thank you guys for all the nice remarks. Uh, also feel free to comment on our LinkedIn page. And uh, with this, I already thank you from my side. It was a pleasure to moderate this event with you. And I hand it over to the presidents, uh, Thomas, Danny, uh, for maybe some final remarks. Thank you. I should just, Rudiger goes first, that I go last. Good. Uh, for, for, for me, it was a pleasure exactly to bring this idea, which we had to life. And I don't know if we announce once one, one, one nice things, I, I do it, because this is exact, exactly today only the appetizer for what we want to do in the next spring, because the next spring we invite the cyclic investors to burn exactly at the CTEM um, uh, startup hub, exactly to have a cyclic CTEM uh, SSC investor day for focusing on MedTech. And I think this is exactly how we want to work and to build this crossover and to learn from each other. Thank you. Okay, Danny. from my side, I can only say it was the most interesting. Now you have to understand, I had no clue about startups uh, until probably 2019 when I joined uh, CITEM as chairman of the board, and then I grew into that. But I had, of course, a long history with Straumann and Geischlich and all these companies, but they were established ones. I think many of the informations were absolutely true. I think one point is important. That's actually my experience. If you want to be successful in the market, you need top medical professionals who publish in top journals and who go to the conferences to show the innovation to attract the interest of the peers. I think that's very important to have as well, because uh, you as a company person will not be able to convince the medical doctors to go to new technology. They have to hear that from colleagues who have the reputation that they're really serious guys. And uh, that makes the whole thing a little bit complicated, but I think uh, from uh, from SSC, I'm very pleased that we have uh, this uh, collaboration with SIGTIC. We can learn a lot from SIGTIC, that's no question. But also, I think we can offer a lot because this campus in Bern has a huge potential. And uh, so I think I, I'm a strong believer in, in the synergies, Schulterschluss activities. And so I look forward very much to end of February when we have our Investors Day in Sitteminsel. Thank you, Danny. Thomas. Excellent. And with that, it's time to wrap up. So there was a question about whether Citic already has invested into a medtech startup in the past. Did the number conjuring end of last year, we had 254 investments, out of which 14 were in health tech, as we call it. We didn't have a specific uh, vertical called medtech, but it's basically part of our health tech label so far. Uh, for example, we had two blood pressure monitoring devices that we have uh, financed, or Ocolore that prevents blindness. So we also did like real medtech stuff, not just on the data part. Uh, and it's about 5% of the total portfolio of our investors. I think there's much more potential out there. And I really hope together with uh, the strong support of CITEM and everybody in this ecosystem that knows really how, how it's done with all, all these advisors that are in medtech, I think we can bring to the next level, just uh, giving access to our investors to a very interesting opportunity. And yeah, end of February, we'll have this event and everybody who was on this um, webinar today, we're going to send you an invitation as soon as we have the details figured out. And hopefully you can join either live or on the live stream. Thanks for attending. And with that, I close down the webinar. Thanks for coming. Bye. If you want Bye -bye. to invest, yeah, that's the QR code. Thanks. <laughs> <laughs>